So it's Holy Week. As Jeff said, this is something that the Christian church has celebrated for 2,000 years. It's a week, interestingly enough, of significant spiritual warfare. If you think about it, many times we don't think about that. Many of us probably just go and say, okay, it's Palm Sunday. We're going to have our pancake breakfast. Let's have our peeps. Next thing you know, it's Easter. We're opening the Easter basket. But what I'm asking you today is to reflect on who you are in Christ and what is your faith in Christ. We see in this week, 2,000 years ago, the spiritual battle of the world the flesh and the devil all culminating in this week. We have to meditate on Jesus turning towards Jerusalem, his final and major step towards going to the cross, towards his selfless selfless sacrifice for us, laying down his life, his victory over sin and death, ushering in a new phase of spiritual warfare that we've been talking about, that we have the battle to fight. As you saw in the the verses earlier that was read, the multitudes were using palm branches. They were waving them and they were putting cloaks over the road. The palm branches at the time signified victory, triumph, the cloak, honor, believing that he was actually, as Jeff alluded to, most of them believed that he was their earthly Messiah, the earthly king to come that was going to take over the Romans. And they were going to live happily ever after, no longer under the print of the Romans. The world system in place was the power of the Pharisees who ran the religious system in Jerusalem. But they didn't understand who Jesus was. They actually even told while Jesus was riding in and the multitudes were shouting, they said, tell your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus said, I can't, because if I did that and they were quiet, even the rocks would cry out. This is such an important event that we have to take and reflect on with our faith. Jesus weeps as he goes into Jerusalem, knowing that many of these multitudes will condemn him and turn away from him within a week's time. This is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, a week that is a culmination of a major spiritual warfare, major battle, one that started in Genesis and is won at the cross. And that provides us the context as we talk about our armor again this week. So let me reflect on Ephesians 6. And you can actually see the entire armor behind us. So thanks, Heather, for putting that up. Uh, We're going to make references to all this. But this is the perfect week to reflect on the armor that we have and the victory in Jesus and how we use it in battle. So Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against blood, against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, and in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So let's reflect on what we've covered so far as we come into this week of Easter and what Jesus is going to do. Reflect, we've reflected on the truths of Scripture the belt of truth, that you must understand what the truths are so that you can walk confidently in those promises. Who you are, who Jesus is, the power that he brings over sin and death, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. We reflected on the breastplate of righteousness and that he gives us our worth through his shed blood on the cross. We are made right with God through him. We reflected on our understanding of peace, that we are now at peace with God. The shoes of peace that Jeff talked about. We talked about this battle is not against enemies of flesh and blood. Right? But it's of what is unseen, the spiritual forces. But we have several enemies that we contend with. The flesh, or our sin nature, the world, 
What's going on in, this, in, the, in the world that would take us away from who God wants us to be? And the devil. I alluded to the fact that we saw all this in the week of Jesus coming to the cross. We saw Jesus' emotional and physical pain in the garden. We saw a system of religious people that want him dead and were pulling people away to believe in him. People who, when he went into the city, said, we believe in you, save us. Oh, son of David, and a week later said, crucify him. And we saw the devil working through Judas in the moment. A spiritual battle. We talk about taking every thought captive in this world. Pay attention to vain philosophies, deceitful schemes, philosophies of men that may be contrary to the word of God. Jeff talked a lot about 1 Peter 5.8. says the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Jesus says he's a liar and a deceiver. James says, resist the devil, confirming that we must stand. This is a battle for truth, as we had said over and over and over again. It is a battle about the truth of Scripture, the truths that you believe. And then today, we're going to take it a step further to say, what do you believe and how do you act in that by faith? The shield of faith is our focus today. So let's dig into that specifically. Ephesians 6.16 says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. I prefer the NASB, which says all the flaming arrows. So you have this hang up with darts. Because uh, it just reminds me of the college days, throwing darts at a board. So, and with which you extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So let's take a minute to look at this specifically. He says, in all circumstances, or the uh, addition, different version says, in addition to all. So literally what Paul is saying is saying, hey, you've already put on, you already have the whole armor of God. You have all those truths that we talked about. The truth of, of salvation, the truth of peace, the truth of righteousness, and the truths that are said about in terms of who Jesus is and the power that he has. We have that whole armor that's already on. Now he's emphasizing again, hey, just do this one other thing. Make sure you do this too. Think of it in terms of when you go to battle, all your armor is already on, and right before you go to battle, what do you do? You pick up the shield of faith and you run out with your sword, right? So in addition to having all that on, now take up the shield of faith. This is a new action. It refers to the idea of in a purposeful and strong manner. Take it up. So Paul is saying, yes, now, especially be purposeful now when you pick up your shield of faith. Why? Because you're moving from believing truths to acting on those promises, being confident in what Jesus is saying. So we put on the whole armor and then we pick up the shield of faith. We take it up and we go into battle. Corinthians emphasizes a similar action when Paul says, walk by faith not by sight. This phrase, walk, to act, to move forward purposely, confidently. James emphasizes the same thing. Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer of the word. This talks about taking action, moving forward. Walk by faith, not by sight. Again, it supports the fact that we're dealing with spiritual forces that are unseen. We don't look at what is seen, rather we fix our confidence in things that can't be seen, meaning a confident in what Scripture says Jesus said he is, who Jesus said he is, who he says we are. We fix our confidence on those things. For the things that we see now will be gone, but the things that we cannot see will last forever. So we've talked about, in addition to all that, take up the shield, and it's an action. Let's define faith for a minute. It's actually right up here. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It is trust and confidence in God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, his promises and character. As Pastor Brian Jensen used to say, faith is trusting that God is who he says he is, will do what he says he will do. Even if it's not seen, this is the same in the past, present, and future. 
So faith is that certainty, that confidence of what those promises are, even though we can't see it. It's taking present day possession of what the gospel says, even though you don't feel like it. What God has revealed in his word becomes our present reality. Do you confidently believe that today? So let's touch on the difference. There's a nuance between faith and beliefs. So let's talk about beliefs. Actually, Dr. Frederick Price in how faith, a book called How Faith Works says that belief and faith are two sides of the coin. Belief is a reason explanation. Maybe it's something that we think we have evidence for beyond a reasonable doubt, right? You have evidence for something. Could be knowledge about something. Could be an experience, whatever that is. Faith is acting on that belief with confidence and assurance that a, that belief is true. So let me give you some simple, some simple examples. You drove here. You believed that the car would drive. Faith was getting in the car and driving. You're sitting here. You believe that that chair is going to hold you. Faith is actually sitting in that chair, thinking that it's going to hold you. You will, or you did, you will eat pancakes this morning. The belief is that they will nourish you. The faith is actually eating the pancakes that they make for you. All right? It's the action. It's saying, I believe the Bible is the word of God. I'm actually going to do confidently what the word of God says, even if I don't see that truth right now. You are a son or daughter of God. I don't feel like I'm a son or daughter of God. You should not be ashamed. I feel ashamed. You are no longer guilty, but I feel guilty. You're acting on the promises of the God, even though if it doesn't feel right, you can't see it right, you don't agree with what it says, you're acting on those promises. We are focusing on trust in God. Belief, yes, is having some sense of evidence. But the faith is acting on what we know those promises of Jesus. And I'm not talking about a blind faith here either. Like we, use, we hear that a lot in the world today. Um, there are reasons for the belief that we have. And Peter even says that you should have reasons. So at the very least, it's the truth of the resurrection that we're focusing on this week and your own salvation story. Those are, can be the, the minimum amount of evidences that you may have for your beliefs. Hebrews 11.6 goes on to say, it's impossible to please God without faith. So we have to have faith, not just belief. What are some examples? Creation. None of you have seen it, but you live in it. You know that we're here. But by faith, we believe that God created. By faith, we look at the world and see it designed. By faith, we believe it's his handiwork. Abraham believed in God. By faith, he went to sacrifice Isaac on the mountain. Many, as we read through the book of Matthew, many believed in Jesus, and several times you hear, by faith, by faith, by faith they were healed, by faith they were set free, by faith uh, they, a miracle was done. Each time they were acting, actively approaching Jesus. Even in this week's story of Jesus going to Jerusalem, one Two people that we don't talk about a lot. Two disciples that had a simple task. Hey, go into town and get a donkey. If someone asks you about it, tell them the Lord's in need of it. So what did they do? They went into town. They asked for the donkey. And someone said, well, what in the world do you need that for? Now, I'm paraphrasing. But can you imagine that? Two people walking up. No money. Nothing's offered that we know of. We, I need this donkey. Why do I need that? Well, the Lord is in need of it. And you know what? Nothing suggests that they hesitated. They walked down. They got it. They brought the donkey back. Right? Even that simple act of faith. Even the act of faith of people laying the palm branches. That was still an act of faith. Now, maybe that wasn't a full faith for some, but it was still an act of faith. They believed that this person is going to be their king. So that's a little bit about faith. So let's dig into the shield, because I'm going to stick with the shield for the rest of the time to use the shield as an analogy about our faith. 
So Ephesians 6 says, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So in this example, people suggest that Paul is referring to a three foot by five foot shield that the Romans used that usually had a leather covering in it that was soaked in water. The Romans at that time actually used two shields. One was a circular shield, more generally for hand-to-hand combat. If I'm fighting somebody with a sword, the second one was this three-by-five shield. The reason people think that he's referring to that three-by-five shield is because that leather that was soaked in water was used to do what? Quench the fiery arrows that people were shooting them from the castle. That helped them protect from those fiery arrows. So the analogy works because the fiery arrows come from the devil. So I'm going to stick with that analogy, but I'm going to use it to explain faith in three ways. One is, do you have a shield at all? Two is, are you using a small round shield? Is it small? Or three, do you have a mature faith where you're using the full shield? The other thing I want you to consider as I create a call to action for you is the unity of the Roman soldiers when they use these big shields. So they all walk together with these big shields. And when the arrows were launched, they would lift them up. Why? Because they were protecting the arrows from coming down on their heads. And it only worked if they could all lift those together. The second way they did it is when they, the way they marched and the way they stayed together, if an army was coming towards them, they would all move the shields together collectively so that they could not be pushed back. What happens? Once one breaks ranks, then they start to fall back. The idea, though, is that they're all working in unity of their faith in the shield with each other to fight the battle. As we go through this, we have to keep in mind that we all have to fight this battle in unity as a body. So let's talk about these three shields. The first shield is no shield, no faith. So I will tell you that everybody in this world has an object of your faith. Now we explain faith as belief and confidence in a divine being. Other people in this world would explain their faith in themselves. I'm a good person. Science is all there is. Government will protect me. Another person I believe in. The earth is mother and I will take, she will take care of me. The universe will take care of me. There's a worldly philosophy, or maybe in this case, there's actually a prince of this world that I believe in. You have an object of your faith. You have faith in something, whether it's a higher power in Jesus Christ or whether it is any one of those things I talked about. Blaise Pascal, I love this example because people who, who um, feel that they don't have reason for their faith, for those of you who don't know Blaise Pascal, he was a child prodigy at the age of 16 in mathematics. French mathematician, inventor, physicist, um, prob- he, he created geometry, probability theory, was involved in economics, the calculators that we use today, scientific methods, and pressure in a vacuum. The reason I say all that is because a lot of times people think, oh, you Christians, you people have faith. It actually is an unreasoned faith. You're very ignorant people for what you believe. And I would attest that that is not the case. We have a reason for the faith that we have and what we act in. And Blaise Pascal, who was this engineer, the reason I bring him up, he says in his, in his um, book, Ponsace, he says, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. Now, I am certain that the world or someone's philosophy professor probably never told you that such a scientific mind would believe in a reason faith like that, believe in a Creator. Now, if you have no shield, no faith, Romans tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Ephesians also tells us that that faith, that salvation by grace, unmerited favor, you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of the works that no one may boast. So I want to remind you of what the story is so that you have heard it. Paul reviews this in Corinthians. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. 
He's headed to Jerusalem. He was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He appeared to Peter, to the 12, to more than 500 at one time, most at that time who were still alive, then to James, then to the apostles, and then to Paul. We have a witnessed, resurrected Savior. We preach it so if you do not have a shield of faith, so that you would believe. Paul even says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. And we obviously do not believe that. We walk in faith. So faith serves as your defense against the enemy's assaults in the spiritual realms. Even if you don't think you believe that, hear the gospel word today. You even have fiery arrows. So the other part of the phrase is it quenches all the fiery darts or the arrows. What are the fiery darts that might be coming your way towards someone who has a little faith or no faith, I should say? Well, Jeff alluded to it. You are at war with God. The devil doesn't need to do too much. But I will say it may sound foolish to you. But beware of men's philosophies today as you look at that. Some common objections have already been answered. What I'm asking is that you actually go and purposefully research them. Well, suffering exists. Miracles contradict science. Evolution explains life. Innocent people die. Good people go to hell. Church history is littered with violence. I just have my doubts. Yep, those are all objections. Every single one of them have been answered by someone in the faith. If you would only take the time to go study and look at them. The parable of the sower would say that you are this person of anyone who hears the word and does not understand it. The evil one comes and snatches it away from what's sown in your heart. What I want you to do is do next is take up the shield of faith today. You've heard the gospel. If you don't have the faith, you've heard the gospel. And Paul tells us, with the heart, the man believes, and with your mouth, confession is made up to salvation. You've heard the gospel, and I want you to go take a reasonable look at this Jesus who is resurrected from the dead. Because you may have, and you may sincerely have an answer that Dr. Norman Geisler might suggest, or C.S. Lewis, who was also previously an atheist, Um, They both say, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. So I want to challenge you if you're sitting here today and you don't know who Jesus Christ is, go take a full look at the evidence and come talk to somebody. That's the first thing that I would ask you to do next is put faith in them. What about the small shield? Small round shield. This is what I would call uh, little faith or easy believism. Now as I go into faith, I'm only using three examples All of us who are in Christ have probably varying degrees of faith, okay? We're growing in maturity, but I'm only using three examples here. This one is the small shield, what I'm going to call easy believism, and I'm going to get into that a little bit. Jesus uses multiple times in Matthew and in Luke and in other various places, he says to his own disciples, oh, you of little faith, He said this to this after the disciples heard the Sermon on the Mount. He healed. He cleared someone from demon possession. He created a miracle. He fed the 5,000, and they didn't understand it. And he says, oh, you have little faith. He says this to when they're dealing with a storm in the boat, and they don't know what to do after everything they just saw. And he says, oh, you have little faith. He says it when they don't understand his teaching and, think, and they think he's dealing about talking about bread, but he's really talking about the Pharisees, and they just don't understand it. And he says, oh, you have little faith. Jesus is not casting them aside. Please don't misunderstand me. You're not being cast aside because your faith is little. It's a faith that could take and grow like a mustard seed, right? But he is helping them grow. C.S. Lewis says this. He says, people in this category, generally, of of just growing faith or nurturing faith or little faith, he says, "Can can you hold on to and act on your beliefs in spite of what he calls your changing moods? So in other words, at some point in time, you are going to experience what he calls the rebellion of moods. Things are going to go wrong. You're not going to like it. It's not going to feel good. You're not going to know why you feel it. He calls them emotions, feelings, imaginations is going to come your way. But Ephesians says that people with the small shield are tossed to and fro. 
carried by the wind, whichever way it blows. This idea of easy believism, Pastor Dan McCubbin calls, has coined it. He says, we say a prayer. We join a church, join a club, and all of a sudden, we're Christian. He says, too often we think, I prayed a prayer, so I'm going to heaven. I believe in Jesus, but James says, even the demons believe in Jesus and shudder. We say, I do a lot of good things in Jesus' name, but Jesus himself says, depart from me, I never knew you. Phrases like that scare me, but they're true because I think it causes us to reflect on who we are and where we are and what we believe so that we're not tossed to and fro, so that we're not taken captive by our rebellion of moods, so that when we say we have little faith, we can what? Know that Jesus is not casting us aside, but is calling us to continue to grow. Easy believism, he goes on to talk about that we're comfortable in our own lifestyle, our own beliefs, which you have, but you don't walk by faith biblically in how we face life. We ask Jesus in our heart, but we tack on our own worldview. We shape God in our own image rather than who he is. We don't read the Bible. We don't engage kids in, spiritual, in a spiritual walk. We don't look to disciple others. You might ask, where might I be ask, acting this way? Well, I would say use this week to review Ephesians chapters 4 through 6. Could be your personal walk, could be your unity of the church, could be in your marriage, could be towards your kids, could be your kids towards your parents, could be in your work. This is why faith, confidence in God's promises is necessary in spite of the storms, in spite of the moods, in spite of what we feel, in spite of the emotions. John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress calls this character Mr. Little Faith. The parable of the sower tells us that tribulation and persecution arises on the account of the word and that are choked out by the cares and worries of the world. People say being Christian is a foolish, it's unfounded, or for ignorant people. Feelings, moods, imaginations, lusts. Mr. Little Faith is characterized by guilt, mistrust, being faint-hearted. But Christian in the story says, alas, the problem with you is you rest in your own strength. You need to put on the whole armor of God, he says. C.S. Lewis adds two more things of what can come up and characterize this faith. He says we might move into what he calls the bargain. I can do more, and therefore I should have better faith. He calls that the bargain. He also says you could also move into a different form of thinking called the exam. You really aren't good enough. I'm not passing the exam. All these are challenges to those of little faith that we have to stand up uh, and start to grow and walk in faith. Pick up that shield. So what's next for you is to grow your shield. Ephesians 4.13 says, Attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to become a mature man. Grow up in all aspects of him. So I'm going to cover the last shield and then the calls for each of them. So the last shield is this the three by five shield, three by five feet shield. It's a mature faith. What are some characteristics of a mature faith? Strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, standing firm, unwavering trust. We have examples of this that are not perfect but faithful. Jeff preached an entire sermon on Abraham. We know that Moses had his own issues. David, Daniel, Paul, the church in Acts, all not perfect, but all called to strive towards holiness. James says we sh that the mature faith has perseverance. Peter says that we're persistent in prayer and word, that we can contend for the faith. Peter also says that we have humility and obedience. The parable of the sower says it's the one who hears the word and bears fruit. So those are some characteristics of a mature faith. And do we have, even if you're mature in your faith, do you still have fiery arrows? Yes, we do. What are those? Well, I mentioned some of them from Ephesians. Could be anywhere you walk, the church unity, marriage, family, kids, work. Two others that C.S. Lewis brings up, one is forgetting 
the simplicity of your faith. It's just forgetting that it's Jesus Christ and him crucified on the cross. And he talks about also being puffed up with the pride of knowledge because we know a lot more that we have to remember the purity of our faith. So what's next for the mature faith? It's to perfect your shield. Matthew says, be perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. So what have we covered? We've defined faith today. We've defined that during this week is a great time to reflect on the victory that Jesus has. Reflect on what he did and walk in those confidences. Build your faith this week because it's a great example of the spiritual warfare where you can focus on that, reflect on that, meditate on that and say, how can I build my faith? Do I have no faith? Can I, should I look at it and confess it? And take on a faith. Do I have a small faith? How can I grow it? Do I have a mature faith? How can I perfect it? So what's the practical application? If you have no shield of faith, take up the shield. Pick it up. Identify where your faith lies and the obstacles to your faith in God. Pick it. Research it. Research the obstacle and go talk to someone about it. If you don't know what that obstacle is, then I would say just pick up a book, a very simple read called The Case for Easter. Start there and go talk to someone about it. If that's you have no shield of faith, no faith, pick it up and do that. Have a reasonable discussion with someone else about it. Most of the time, it's not intellectual that gets in your way. It's your feelings and emotions. Just take up the shield. What's your obstacle? Go talk to someone about it. Research it. If you have a small shield of faith, the idea is to grow your shield. Let's mature it. The first, as Paul says, examine yourself. Examine yourself first. Test to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? Those of you of ye of little faith, or where you're trying to grow your faith, Jesus Christ is in you. Test yourself that you believe that. Because if you do not believe that, you can't walk in confidently in those promises. And then identify some common challenges and do some things that we've already talked about. What common challenges do your faith have? What doubt? What fear? What temptation? What suffering? Take it captive. Meditate and pray on it specifically in Scripture on what that challenge is. Find a doctrinally correct worship song and immerse yourself in thinking about it. And then talk it through with a brother and sister. See, all of these end with talking it through with someone else. Why? Because it's the unity of faith that these shields can build up. The last is if you have a big shield, you have a, you have a mature faith, the idea is to perfect your shield. Hone the edges. Fix the holes in the leather. Re-soak it so it's wet. What am I calling you to is build up the body. Use your mature faith to build up the body. Encourage the congregation. Ephesians 4.13 says, Build up the body until we attain all attain the unity of faith. Our work is not done until the entire body is built up to mature faith. Who can you disciple? Who can you contend for the faith with? Where else can you be a doer of the word? Now, I'm not suggesting there that it's just about doing another thing. What I'm saying is Jesus may be calling you to stretch your faith into something a little bit more. So don't settle for that. So what is that? So build up the body. Perfect your faith. So as we prepare our hearts this week for Easter celebration, I encourage you to take up the shield of faith. Either for the first time or for a new time or a time to perfect it. Don't let this week fall away without reflecting on that so you can stand firm in our trust in God, and walk by faith. Trust in the truths of Scripture. Walk by faith. As simple as the two disciples who went and got the donkey. Confidently saying the Lord has need of it. Confidently choosing the Scriptures. As the multitudes waving the palm branches said, we have the victory, the triumph in Jesus Christ. Lay aside every sin which entangles us and run the race confidently. Fixing our eyes upon Jesus, 
who is the author and perfecter of our faith. So now, in addition to all those things, take up the shield of faith, expand its size, walk knowing, as the word says, that it will extinguish all flaming arrows. So you've heard me use this word many times when I've talked about other scripture, that word all. It doesn't say some. It doesn't say kind of, sort of. The word says it extinguishes or quenches or puts out all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So you have the armor on. Walk in those beliefs. Now walk in faith with your shield of faith.